Some of us screamed so loudly and furiously when President Emerson Umningagwa appointed Constantino Chiwenga as the health minister, or, more accurately, when the vice president appointed himself the health minister, a few years ago. As a result, when Umningagwa unveiled his most recent cabinet following the August elections, Chiwenga was removed from that role. The vice president running that ministry was never going to make sense. The only qualification Chiwenga had was that he had been gravely ill after the 2017 coup and had spent a lot of time in hospitals. If Umningagwa does something admirable, you don't immediately rejoice. That's because he's a clever scam artist. He offers you a nibble with one hand while removing a full load with the other. This past week, exactly that occurred. If you give it some thought, You'll see that the president has effectively transformed himself into a super minister with the flick of a pen. He enacted 13 laws in his own office, which is astounding. By way of statutory instrument 189 of 2023. That was declared. This indicates that he will take the 13 statutes away from the appropriate ministries and administer them himself. We won't learn the real reasons for the president's decision to become such a bothersome person for a very long time. But there is one thing for sure. This is a really worrying move. You get the impression that Zimbabwean affairs won't turn out well. Whatever the case, one thing is undeniable. Given the nature of the majority of the laws, Mingagwa has chosen to relocate them to a grain house at his homestead in rural Zvishavane, where he is from. This guy isn't spending any time accumulating prospects for power and food around himself. In other words, he engages in lawfare to increase his control over the situation and to eat more. It effectively means that the president will have direct, unrestricted control over the administration of certain specific statutes rather than leaving it up to the minister's whims. But it wasn't essential. All of Umningagwa's recently appointed ministers are nothing more than a loose swarm of groveling puppets. The fact that Jawinga, his first vice president, was compared to a brooding duck, exactly what a vice president in Zimbabwe must be, is even more striking. Let's start with the Sovereign Wealth Fund Act and the feeding issues. You are already aware that this law was recently dubbed the Matapa Investment Fund. Normally, a name or name change has no effect. It appears, however, that the decision to change the name was made in order to generate enough drama to draw attention away from what was actually going on. At least 20 parastatals are governed by the Matapa Investment Fund Act, including People's Own Savings Bank, Kavimba Mining House, Cold Storage Commission, NRZ, Telwan Kotko, and Zupko. It appears that Umingagwa was not content to just reduce the authority of Finance Minister Mthilinkyu by appointing his own son Kuda as the Deputy Minister. The Sovereign Wealth Fund Act has been taken away from the minister in order for him to carefully examine it as he diversifies the dishes on the dinner table. There is something suspicious about practically all of the peristatals that Umingagwa has firmly placed under his personal shoulder. They have a notoriously corrupt past. The political class has taken advantage of them in order to line their own coffers. The Mutapa Investment Fund is a sizable cookie jar that was established or re-established without bothering to consult parliament. In order to raise more money, it is supposed to use investment surpluses. The results of the privatization of public entities, government transfers, as well as other fiscal surpluses and resource incomes. To say that individuals who are close to the fund have the opportunity to perform a variety of things with our money is a mouthful. Millions of cash will end up in personal accounts through smuggled and corrupt contracts and employment covert externalization, and tax havens for individuals who have the chance to take advantage of the fund. It can also be utilized to establish monopolies. You will hear about a variety of projects being started utilizing money from the fund in the not-too-distant future. And one thing is for certain. The main cast members will be Umingagwa and his allies, including Kuda Tagwairiai. Please take note that Tagwairiai has previously participated in contentious efforts at several of the businesses that will be governed from Umningagwa's office. 
They include Kavimba Mining House, a strange business that was established after Tagwire I was subject to international sanctions in an equally inexplicable manner. Notwithstanding Mingadwa's efforts to persuade us that it is a government portfolio. This organization was not established with the help of parliament or the cabinet. Its interests include mining and engulf the entire valley. In actuality, it was created to cover up Tagwire I's business interests after the sanctions and to provide a location for various forms of thievery. You are also aware of the Landela Agreement. Landela, Tagwire I's offspring, entered into a murky agreement with Supco to purchase buses so that they would look to be owned by the public transportation company. But in actuality, those are Tagwire I's buses. Check to see if Amningadwa is nearby when you see Tagwire I, though. The Zimbabwean National Oil Company is no different. Tagwire I exploited that government organization to gain monopolistic control over Faruka, a massive oil pipeline that runs from Mozambique to Harare. The deal's public face was Kuda. If he weren't dining with the big boys, he wouldn't have been able to take advantage of such a deal by himself. Gaps must be filled in nevertheless, just in case someone decides to be impolite and try to stick their own snort in the plates. The Anti-Corruption Act, the Act on Commissions of Investigation, the Act on the Interception of Communications, and the Act on the Prevention of Corruption all come in handy in this situation. The Mingadwa will have control over who is probed and who is not for claims of corruption because to the direct administration of these laws. The President will have the option of who and what to bug thanks to the Interception of Communications Act. He will be the only one to make this decision, and it will not be him. His sons, Tagwiriai, or the other young people in the village. Overall, it indicates that Umingagwa is erecting a perimeter wall to keep himself and his friends out of sight when they eat. Especially his adversaries in the government and the ruling ZANU-PF party. Given the fierce faction conflicts within the ruling party, that was a wise move on his part. The fact that some of the laws he has housed in his office are power laws is also telling. The Zimbabwe National Security Council Act is an additional regulation to those already mentioned. Knowing how politics operate in Zimbabwe will also inform you that all major decisions are made by the heavily armed Security Council. That council essentially has control over Zimbabwe. Everything is decided by it, including how to steal elections and when summer will begin and finish. You can clearly understand where Mingabwa is going with the royal staff if you consider what he has already accomplished in a short period of time. Everyone in the government right now is either his son, uncle, niece, or pawn. That's a wise Machiavellian move for tyrants. He is now returning home with all the power laws. Not well will come of it. Let it go.